Welcome back to Gunplug Grandpa's. Today, we're going to be doing a tutorial on how to use a new medium slash how to airbrush things. The Mr. Surfacer 1500 is the one that I usually use once the kit is primed and cleaned. You want to make sure that it's free from dust, that you sand any imperfections on there and get it to a nice kind of smooth finish. I'm trying to figure out where the center of the the camera is, even though I drew all those circles to try to align the very center. I was curious what those circles were for. It was so that I could aim better and uh, it only partially worked. But going over kind of how to put stuff on sticks, usually you want to get an area that's not going to be covered in paint. I usually go for joints, like you can kind of see here on this backpack. That's the piece that attaches to the actual kit itself and it locks into place through those channels right there. It's a perfect anchor point for these little sticks that you can use and that way you're not going to mess up your final coat of paint because you will have a uniform kind of surface area. I usually try to aim for areas that aren't going to be seen in the final kit either so if there's two pieces that kind of join together then that's usually the spot that I'll go for. Another thing to kind of keep note of is to make sure that your stick has a good grip on the piece itself. Make sure it's dust free. I have this really thick paintbrush that I use to make sure that any particles or hairs that have been lingering are off. And here we go. Just gotta make sure you have a good connection because you will be pushing air against it so you want to make sure that it has a solid, nice grip on the actual piece. Moving on. Yeah, just want to make sure you have a good grip. I Thought actually that's not struggle with seen. that a lot. Uh, some kits I feel like are just difficult to get. And even if they do have a good location to grip on, um, mm -hmm. I can't get a good connection point. And I always struggle a little bit with that. Well, sometimes it's good to do sub-assemblies like this. And like this one had a lot of places to grip onto even before that. But sometimes when you make a sub-assembly, like, like I've been saying with the joints and stuff, uh, like if, say, an elbow joint, you know how usually in those elbow joints, there's a pipe that kind of runs through a circle. Yes. You can just grip on that pipe and then there you go. You got a good uh, melting spot. This is the Sotar 2020. This is my weapon of choice. It is a dual action airbrush. Dual action meaning that you can pull back and control the intensity of the flow. As you can see here, you can pull back. Single action airbrush is when you just pull it, uh, push down and it just sprays. It's the needle on the inside. This thing actually has a super durable needle. It's um, very impressive because the tip of the Sotar 2020 is unshielded. Mr. Tool Cleaner, this stuff is awesome for cleaning your airbrush. A lot of people like to complain that cleaning off the airbrush is a hassle, it's hard, yada, yada, yada. This stuff works absolute wonders. And if you don't have nice tools, kind of like a um, like an ultrasonic cleaner, this stuff will 100% save so much time and so much heartache, so. Also, cleaning your airbrush is very important, so do it. Do it often a brief yeah a brief clean before and a brief clean after and maybe a thorough cleaning uh once a month every two months yeah you want to make sure that's the habit i was getting into yeah you want to make sure it's clean because if it's not then you're gonna have a lot of issues with pushing out stuff this is also a nice tool to have this is a paint mixer that uh my sister got me for christmas so thank you sis for that present it's awesome i have used it a lot but uh so when you mix your paint you want to use like an actual thing that agitates the paint so maybe a stirring stick or something like that or if you have a paint mixer like that it uses vibration to actually mix the paint so you get a nice even coat with the paint so now we're going to start actually airbrushing the best method to kind of do this is to have a back and forth sweeping motion it uses the uh, it uses less paint to make a sweeping motion and it gives you an even coat. So I'm gonna show here sweeping motion. 
you want the sweeping motion here, as you can see, where you can kind of go where you start at one end and stop at the under other, so you're not over spraying by maintaining a constant pulse through it. I just start and stop as I go to the end. This piece right here, I've kind of experienced coming in. I know how much uh, plastic pieces can kind of take after doing it for so long, but this is one of those things where it's, you have to do it. You can't really take my word for what is too good and what is not good enough right now. Like if you've never touched an airbrush, what I'm saying to you may give you some confidence to do it in the future. But as far as explaining what it is, you're not going to know until you actually try it. Until you actually get hands on it, you're going to start to understand more of what too much, what too little, and what your kits, what you're looking for your kits from airbrushing will need. This is kind of just a tutorial to get an idea of what will work best and this is honestly what works best for me so if this helps you get into it then good yeah including even the distance there because you look like you're what inches away yeah i mean i'm like two or three inches away and this is something that the sotar allows you to kind of adjust on how far back you pull on the actual thing so i know that i'm not going to overspray because the maximum amount that i can pull back on that trigger is controlled. Yeah, I have, uh, I think my airbrush actually allows that, but I enjoy having the full spray. Uh, just because I'm still relatively new to, to thinning my paints out. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm always like, I need to stay, you know, six inches to a foot away. <laughs> Otherwise, I will <laughs> overspray, and it sucks. So this is kind of a finished piece. You want to make sure that you have an even coat on there. And see, even like from being outside, there's dust. You'll get dust everywhere. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to put this russet color. What I'm trying to do here, I guess I should probably explain is I'm going to be creating a rust effect. So I'm going to be chipping off the final coat and getting back into these two colors, this orange and russet color. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to spray those two colors. I thought about using this brown. I didn't use it. Uh, but I'm going to be using this chipping medium. And what this is going to do is that it's going to create a barrier between my rusted painted surface and the final color surface of this green right here. And what I get to do after the fact is I get to brush off the top layers of paint. So here we're going to kind of go into a little speed montage of, again, making sure that your stuff is clean every single little piece. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that it is nice and clean so that you can accurately brush. And because this is a new thing that I haven't tried before, uh, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to gum up my stuff. This is the point of the needle. That is a very small piece. Just kind of showing that, yeah, there are a lot of tiny pieces, so be careful uh, to do this in an area that you know where all your pieces are dropping because you don't wanna lose I know I've lost a couple times, but you don't want to lose the pieces of your airbrush and then have a project come to a halt because you lost the one piece you needed at the end of the nozzle. Um, yeah, that wouldn't be very fun. <laughs> no, it sucks. I, I can speak from experience. It's happened a couple times. So as I'm cleaning this airbrush, I'm going to kind of go back into the, the, the thought process here, right? So the rust, it, it comes in a lot of different kind of colors but they're usually more earthen tones with like reds oranges and browns and that's kind of my thought here i've like i said i haven't used this chipping medium before i did test it out on a spoon to kind of see give myself an idea of how to use it but this would only be the second time i've used it and i don't want it to just go to black because i know that me from experience i've worked on a lot of like um machines that have had enamel paints and stuff on them to protect them and as the paint chips off rust collects within those raised kind of lips that you get from the cracked paint and there's usually a couple layers of paint underneath it as well so there's a whole kind of slew of different colors that pop out before it even hits the metal metal piece that is the machine itself so that's kind of my thought process here um, 
I'm gonna do like a polka dot camo looking thing. You'll see once it's completely done, but that's the most random that I can get with it. It was just basically doing a weird polka dot method. It kind of, uh, it makes like, like a camo like pattern and I named it Truck Nuts because it reminds me of those stores inside of the mall where they're like, fish fear me, women fear me, oh. I fear myself, kind of a thing. Uh, women fear me and fish want me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like a camo that you would buy from one of those stores. Like it's red and orange, like what are you camouflaging into? Yeah. It's pretty much that, but yeah. All right, I kind of put okay. enough to explain that on here, so I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit because it's just me continuing to clean this <laughs> and fiddle with it. You could always explain. I would say you could always explain how you clean it too. Yeah, I mean, you just want to but take it apart. The... Yeah, I guess you're right. You can just you just really want to take it apart as much as you can and as much as you're comfortable with because if you can kind of reach it with q-tips and stuff like that as long as you can get that tool cleaner in there you'll be fine it, it'll yeah. be okay the nice thing about airbrushes modern airbrushes at least now and stuff like that they all come with a diagram that shows you how to take them apart where your o-rings are and all that other stuff because another thing to note while the SOTAR doesn't have a lot of visible O-rings, they're, they're all encased inside of a little chamber. Um, if you use heavy-duty cleaners on your O-rings, you can damage them. And then you'll have to either replace them or find something that works that's kind of um, an alternative, like beeswax and stuff like that. But having to manage that stuff is kind of a pain. So know what you're dealing with in terms of what's inside your your uh your airbrush itself and just kind of get an idea of what the parts are because like say for instance if i didn't know that the nozzle was just kind of free floating at the end of the sotar tip i could have 100 percent just lost that because that piece is maybe like a millimeter at best it is a very very tiny piece it's very easy to see i just flung it right there in that that uh, that brief <laughs> moment so it's a super easy part to lose and you don't want to lose it because if that breaks then your airbrushing is absolutely horrendous on the iwata neo that i had that was the part that broke the most for me was the nozzle and when it breaks that's it it just doesn't spray it doesn't spray correctly at least so make sure that you clean properly make sure you understand all the pieces on your airbrush and make sure that it sprays like here I am just making sure that it still sprays. It's so, very important. Very important. And we're getting on to the next clip here. All right. How I usually thin stuff, I've really, as of late, like to just pour the, <laughs> the thinner into the paint pot itself so I don't have to dirty up another um, another. Uh, container effectively but I'll usually do 50-50 uh, 50% thinner and 50% paint and you want it to look like milk and I know that everybody says this and they don't really show what looks like milk looks like so here it looks like this this is what milk looks like that's the consistency that you want you want it um... to be slightly runny not too runny so, yeah, uh, there's another guy I watch, and he helped greatly helped uh, improve my mixing game. Um, uh, Barbados Rex on YouTube, that old guy. Uh, yeah. All the time, he's like, "This is the paint. Here's what we want it to look like." And so, if you need good visual recommendations, uh, I highly recommend checking. Like any any one of his paint. Uh, reviews are like, here's the paint. Here's the paint in a bottle. It looks like it's really well mixed. It looks like it's very well thick. Here's the ratio I'm doing and what I'm going for. Yeah. Yeah. And here we go. This is just kind of sporadically making spots on this. Oh, so you didn't even paint it all red. Okay, so you quite no. literally just... 
yeah, polka I'm, dotted. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm making it as random as I can to try to make it look as realistic as possible. Because, like, again, in, in nature, it doesn't just change a single color. It just is weird. And I don't have, like, a plan as to how the paint's going to chip. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally just blasting away, man. I'm just blasting haphazardly, and I'm hoping that it'll work. <laughs> I think it worked out really well. We'll see here in the end, but I think that the transitions that I did with the orange and the red, it works really well. I try to focus on some of the areas where it will kind of like collect, where I, I know that if this thing were real, where it would kind of collect rainwater and kind of some mm -hmm. crevices for the red and then just all the spots in between with the orange to make it look like a more focused was the red and a more aged was the orange. So we'll go into super time last mode. Just spray in all the rest of them. And you'll get this really cool a camo effect at the end. I'm excited. It's kind of funny too, because like if I had just stripped off the entire paint, I would just have a, a really ugly camo botom. <laughs> so and yeah, this is a uh, armor trooper botom. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but it is. Oh, yeah, you haven't. Yeah. It's the scope dog. This is the P Bandai version of the Engel Custom. It's the one that has a big fin on the side of it. So going, moving on to the orange now. And again, here's the paint. That is it thinned. Milky. Good. Milky. Milky. The milkies. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> that big painty milky, mommy. So, super time lapse again. Very good. We love the time lapse. Oh yes. You can see that it's it's just very like it looks like it's rusted to all high hell. Like if it had absolutely no paint. But you see how it kind of looks like camo, like really dumb <laughs> camo. Oh, yeah, I can kind of see it. The yeah. orange overtakes the red a little bit, I think. But uh... yeah, I go back for a second pass just to kind of re up the uh, the red a little bit. But I wanted to keep those subtle transitions. I didn't want one to overpower the other. Right. And so this is the test spoon. This is me playing with it and just using a toothpick to kind of scratch along it. The toothpick was a little too abrasive, and you can kind of see that it went all the way through to the spoon. So that's also partially the reason why I wanted to try another layer of paint on top of all of um, the primer itself, because I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to just peel right into the plastic again and here are the instructions for it uh you can pause the video here if you want to kind of see it says apply two to three coats so that's what i can what i am going to do there's an old school method of kind of achieving something similar to this which is to use hairspray and uh, that method eh, i mean before there was there was stuff like this, like the AK Interactive um, chipping solution, and there's there's way more chipping solutions out there for sure. I think Vallejo has their own one. I think Tamiya also makes their own one. But uh, before they had these solutions, people would use hairspray, and it was not great. It was not an awesome way to do this. But here is a finished piece. And you can kind of see that it has a little bit of raised bubbles on there. And that's good. That's fine. Because what I'm going to want from there is when I start scratching off the paint, those bubbles are going to pop and give a more natural kind of a more natural sensation of decay, of rust, of paint peeling and stuff, because it's never in a actual like pattern it's always in a random order so this is kind of one of the finished results that is with some wash Ooh. as well and this is kind of what i wanted that's what it looks like that's really what it looks like so the instructions say that you have to use water to activate it i used it with and without water without water you do peel off way more than you need so i highly recommend using the as as instructed i just have a little 
toothbrush, an old toothbrush here that I'm just going to start scratching at the paint. And you'll kind of see here that as we start scratching it off, it will reveal the truck nuts camo underneath. Scrubby scrub. It will reveal. Scrubby scrub. How how much pressure would you say you had to use? I did not use a lot of pressure because, like I said, it, it like um, with the dry one, it'll peel mm -hmm. off a lot. So if you use a lot of pressure, it will peel it off. I'm I'm just kind of like going haphazard with it. I'm not applying too much pressure on there, just enough to start getting some stuff coming off there. You can kind of see I'm starting to get a little bit of peeling there. Let me adjust the camera a bit. Oh, come on. I think here you can kind of see underneath. You see how you have the darker on the top and kind of the yeah. orange down there. So it kind of gives it a more realistic feel of, of basically being a random, a random decay pattern. And here I just started putting it on the actual toothbrush itself to try to try something different. And that did work a little bit better. I, it does work really well on surfaces that have a lot of ridges on them. So like the arms and stuff was really easy. These little plate panels, I did have to kind of um, give it a couple of passes to make it look how I wanted it to. And now you can kind of see it's starting to patina a little bit on those raised areas. And yep. that's exactly what I want. Instead of going with a brush and doing like a scaled pattern to make it look like it was um, starting to peel off, it just does it by itself. You can kind of see right here, that one was a dry run. So a huge chunk came off. Um, that's kind of the start of that one. And that one was on the photo. So mm -hmm. just kind of scratched off right there. And that's the beginnings of what the top looked like. The top will become way worse. This is just me kind of experimenting with it. I was like, so you were able to to go back multiple times with the water. Yeah, as long as you have the water, it activates it. And here's the other thing too, is that once you're done doing as much damage as you want, you can seal it. You can just use either any top coat of your choice or you can um, put any clear paint on it. I came back and I passed over a little bit more with some clear black paint mm -hmm. over some of those areas to give it a more kind of um, kind of like an oily slick looking stuff on some spots to make it look like soot and others. And um, I went over the entire kit with a clear green, which I should have been a little bit more protective of with some of the yellow decals can it kind of ruin the colors a little bit, mm -hmm. but I mean, I went back with some acrylics and fixed it, but once I put that clear coat on top, yeah, here you go. You can kind of see, this is me just brushing it more and more and more. And you see that pattern, that like speckling pattern that's coming on the top. Mm -hmm. That's super natural, man. As I've seen a lot of, of these things and like, this is very, very close to the real thing. I don't want to like toot my own horn because I'm not really, I'm not doing this. This is literally just the medium doing its job. So this medium is, is, it's really good. Not sponsored by the way, but this stuff's you, pretty good. <laughs> you are doing it. You're taking advantage of the local resources available to us as yeah, modern there you go. hobby makers. <laughs> there you go. I'm doing that. But uh, yeah, it looks, it looks super real. I was very blown away by how not only easy it was to get this effect, but how nice it was. Like this stuff was super great, dude. So. I just keep going at it and I'm just brushing it and it's it's not like it's hard. This was a very like almost relaxing thing to do. And uh, the thing with weathering is that you can 100% overdo it. But hmm. this is kind of like just a relaxed and patient thing to do. I really enjoyed doing it and I, I enjoyed doing it more than I enjoy actually hand painting these kind of things in there because I feel like this accomplished a more realistic feel than if I had just gone in with like a sponge and started dabbing on the sides of these things to uh, give it a uh, like a decayed look. So, so you'd say that this would would you say that this was more overall work though than the sponge? Um, no, I would say that this was less work than the sponge because with the sponge. Oh. 
it's just a lot of like you do a little you look you do a little you look you do a little you look this is literally just passing it over like i was done weathering it maybe in like a little less than an afternoon i didn't really oh, have wow. to do that much more yeah like i'm i'm mostly trying to show on the camera and not overdo it here and that's why it's taking as long as it is mm. but like look at that look i'm done i don't have to yeah. do more there <laughs> that does look so, really good I was uh, really lucky that the, the actual camera on the scope dog, it, um, it's close enough to the thing that it just started scratching off some of the paint, so I really didn't have to do a lot. <laughs> oh, that is nice. Very, very natural, you know. It's, yeah, it's oh no, 100%, because it's like, yeah, mechanically speaking, it would do that. Here are kind of some pictures of in progress. Got some down there on the legs as well. That one also straight from the little skirt scratching up against the actual leg this one is like my favorite that one oh my gosh it just came out so good <laughs> <laughs> dude it just came out so nice so i went back and then i started using some enamel washes to kind of give it more of a rusted look and this is with the decals on there this isn't with the final top coat and stuff but you can kind of tell that yeah that's it is beat up it's beat up to all high hell yeah it looks that looks just a little bit very good. How did a you little so you bit put, very good. <laughs> you put you put the enamels on. Well, I guess we'll see. I assume you went and uh, hit some of the the decals later, huh? Yeah, I went over the decal with yeah, because you can see right here the decal's still a little bit clean, yeah. and uh, I did use the sponging method to blend it in more so that it looked more natural, because that's also kind of one of the things where. Yeah, you know, you can have the natural look, but it, you'll only blend it in if you can make everything match. So I also painted the inside, but that's irrelevant. I just wanted to show everybody how to use this chipping medium. So, but yeah, that's the end of the video. No. Goodbye. <laughs> All right.